For most people, I think, joy is a matter of serendipity. Serendipity is a wonderful word. Uh, somebody was trying to define it once. He said, well, serendipity is when you're looking for the needle in the haystack and you find the farmer's daughter. <laughs> serendipity flits through our lives in a series of little accidents. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. There's a, there's a magnificent section in the book of Proverbs about wisdom where it says, wisdom, wisdom stands in the corner of the streets. Wisdom shouts from the housetops. Wisdom stands in the gates. I mean, it's almost as though he's saying, I don't care where you go, you can't get away from wisdom. Now, that doesn't mean you got it. It just means you keep in running into wisdom no matter where you go, that there is something to learn at every corner. Wisdom is everywhere. Joy is not. Joy is hidden. Joy lurks. Joy comes at the end of a task. Joy comes upon you sometimes a total surprise. We tend to like our, take our vacations in a serendipitous fashion. We, we take off down the road. We have an idea where we're going. We have a general idea of what we want to do. We, one of our favorite vacations was the time when we went to England, and we, we knew what we wanted to do in London for the first week. Had several museums we wanted to hit. We wanted to catch about three musicals, which I think we caught two or three and really enjoyed ourselves in London. And during the daytime, we would say, well, do you want to go to Harrods today or Fortnum & Mason? And we love to go shopping in those really expensive stores. Shopping, I'm saying, not buying, shopping. And see all the nice things. But then at the end of that first week, we rented a car and loaded in a car, and we knew we wanted to go to the Cotswolds, which is a, a bunch of hills out in the west country of England. And we had no idea, more than the fact that the Cotswolds is where you go to find these thatched roof, roof houses and a lot of old stuff. You know, so we, we took off, having no reservations, no nothing, or knowing anywhere where we were going to go. We banged into an antique auction. They may have more than one trip mixed up on this, but I, we went into a little, not, not an antique auction, but an antique st sale. We found in this place this marvelous little cake dish. It had, you know, a cake dish with a platter and, a, and one of these big covers, ceramic cover that goes over it. It was in this beautiful British blue china, you know, with a scene on it and so forth. And it's very, very old. I, I have no idea really just how old it was. But it was done, you know, in, a, in its time. It was a beautiful piece of work, and we wanted it and probably paid more than we should have for it. But as by using American dollars, we thought this is a good deal anyway. So we bought it to buy our home with us. Same, either the same trip or another trip, and I forget which one, we went out to uh, Glastonbury out in the West Country because we wanted to go there because we heard that was where the first Christian church was. And so we went there and wandered through and saw the... Uh, uh, the ruins of the old abbey that was there. We heard about the old Waddle Church was apparently the first one, which is reputed to have been the one that was uh, uh, put there by Joseph of Arimathea, who was the first Christian to come to the British Isles and so forth. And you go through those places, and all the time on this trip we're running into marvelous things that we didn't even know were there. You're driving along a road, and here's an ancient little old church. You pull into the driveway, you stop, you wander inside, and you look around, and you see these graves going back so many centuries. And it's just marvelous, and we like that, that sort of thing. We ran into a lady who had come in to replace the flowers in church that day, and we're able to stand and chat with her for a little while, and then on down the road. These things are memories that they lodge in your mind, and when they come back by... That trip was so much fun... I even enjoyed paying the credit card bills when they came back. Because every credit card bill reminded me of something we had done that we really enjoyed. Well, it was really a funny thing. Uh, we were at home, sitting at our dining room table, and I was looking at this cake dish, when it dawned on me that the scenes on the cake dish were of the ruins of the old abbey at Glastonbury. And suddenly, two totally different little serendipitous things that happened in my life created one more little bit of serendipity, a sudden accident I found at my dining room table between something I bought and something that I had seen that gave me momentary, fleeting, but very real pleasure. I would call it joy. And joy is a lot like that. It comes to you in these little flickers from time to time. And it's here today, and the next thing you know, it's gotten away from you. C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, uh, Pilgrim's Regress, draws a marvelous allegory in which he visualizes way off on the horizon somewhere an island. And, and his, 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 the theme he seems to be saying is that there is in the man's heart, there is a yearning for God and a realization, and every once in a while there's a little image of it, a vision of it, a, a flicker of joy that he sees way off in the distance, and he realizes there is something there that I can have forever, but I don't have it now. And it's, it's a yearning that, uh, you know, perhaps it's like it says in the Bible, that God has placed eternity in men's hearts. Yet so we can't find out the end of it.
from the beginning of it. I, I think it's a marvelous thing, and, and to see that kind of thing passing through our life. I am sure that no one feels joy all the time. I just don't think it could work in a, in a person's life that it would be like that all the time. But my question is, is there a way of joy? Is there a way, a road, a path, a, a methodology? A, is there something that we can think about and study and do? Because here we are, we're talking about the joy of salvation this weekend, and presumably because we want to understand it better, we want to be able to do something about it, we would like to maybe have more of that in our life and a little less of grief and maybe even don't understand the fact that oftentimes the two come into our life at precisely the same time. But is it all an accident? Is there anything that you actually can do about it? Well, I do know, and I know this for a fact, that it is possible to kill joy. I think you can destroy it. Now, I want to show you a really important New Testament lesson on this theme. But before I can, we've got to do a little exercise in biblical exegesis. I want this is free. There's no extra charge for this little sidelight into how to interpret the New Testament. Because I want to take you to a parable. It's in the 18th chapter of Luke. And it's a parable that sometimes people struggle with a little bit. But before I even can explain this to you, I've got to pause for a moment and say this about parables. When I was just a kid in Sunday school in Harrison, Arkansas, I can remember like it was yesterday, the teacher sitting there and telling us now that Jesus' parables were little stories that Jesus told to make his meaning clear. That is simply not true. Anyone who has studied the Bible far enough to, to read you know, the, the parable of the sower and the seed knows that, that parables are not given to make the meaning true. They are not analogies. They are not illustrations. A parable, probably the closest thing to a parable, is an allegory. Pilgrim's Regress by C.S. Lewis is a very long allegory, as is Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. These are, and allegories are given to us where they, they, put, they, they, they turn uh, intangibles or uh, uh, things like wisdom, they turn them into people. And these people walk through the lives of the character in this story. And the, the things that can't, are, are not really persons are made to be persons for the purpose of carrying on the story. Now, the result of an allegory often is that two people can sit down and read through it and get totally different messages from it. And get, get, one can get all kinds of depth out of one. Another one reads it and gets a different kind of, of deepness of meaning out of it. Now, this seems to be, I would say, probably as intentional in the art form, the allegory form, that the author wants to uh, bring, for you to bring something to the story so that you also are able to make a contribution to your understanding of it. So when Jesus begins to speak in par parables, oftentimes, and I think one of the best ways to understand the Lazarus and the rich man in particular, is as an allegory, not as a literal story. Now, what you have here in the 18th chapter of Luke is a parable, uh, maybe not a true allegory in one sense, but it does serve this purpose. He spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, you don't always get this break with a parable. He does not always tell you, I'm telling you this to this end. This case, he says, there was in a certain city a judge that feared not God, nor regarded man. And there was a widow in the city, and she came to him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, I'm not afraid of God, I don't regard man, but I'm getting tired of this woman. Because she troubles me, I'm going to avenge her, I'm going to give her what she just justice on this, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, what's the lesson? A little by our continual coming to God, we may get an answer to prayer that otherwise we might never get. That it's, it's necessary for us to bug God about something. It's necessary for us to persevere in prayer is the lesson, right? Okay. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his only elect, which cried day and night to him, though he bear long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith upon the earth? Now, you're uh, an intelligent audience here. Let me ask you this question. How many of you feel that out of this parable... You can draw the lesson that God is an unjust God, an unjust judge. How many of you feel that God is an unjust judge? Nobody seems to want to buy that. All right. I think that's fair. Because God, of course, is not unjust in any way, shape, or form. So if that's the case, then, this first part of this, this parable, this allegory, is not talking about God. It's talking about an unjust judge. And the woman, because she perseveres, gets what she wants. Now, that happens over there. If that's true over there, then, folks, 
Don't you think we ought to be able to expect God to be able to give us the things that we need and that we want? We not want. Now, the reason why I've given you that parable is because I want to take you to Matthew, the 20th chapter, to one which I think has been variously misunderstood and perhaps misapplied. Matthew, the 20th chapter. It is, it's, it's, it's a problem we get into from time to time because we start out as preachers sometimes to interpret the Bible, and we feel like we have to interpret every line. We feel like we have to explain everything. We have to say, well, this means that, this means the other thing, and we go through all this. Instead, and, and we lose sometimes in the telling of these stories what the thing is really about. Now, this chapter 20 of Matthew is, is I think, an absolutely fascinating uh, example of an allegory. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. He put them to work. Now, we had a lot of bunches of grapes, really beautiful little grapes out here, very tasty, sweet grapes at lunch. And if you can just imagine for a moment, you've gone out early in the morning, it's cool of the day. This is in the later part of the year when the grapes are finally ready to be harvested. Not that long before the Feast of Tabernacles. The feast is lying ahead. And, of course, you're a working man, or you're a working woman, and you've gone down to the place to where they're hiring people, sort of like the Union Hall, as it were. But here's where you go if you want to be hired to pick fruit today. So you've gone down there, you went early, right off the bat of guys down there. Now, they were, these people are working 12-hour days, and there are a couple of reasons. One is they didn't have labor unions, as a matter of fact. But another reason for it is because of the time of year, you, don't have, you have a very narrow margin in which to get those grapes in at that time of the year. The feast is coming, weather can change, the grapes are ready, you want them off the vine today, not tomorrow. So, you work a long day. You got down there early, my first man comes down, hired you, you've got a deal all day. This is joy. This is great. I've got a job. It's a good job. It's not a back-breaking job, because you don't go carrying around 100 pounds you know, of grapes. You, you actually go through the vineyard, taking the grapes off the vine, keeping them in some sort of an apron or something. You take them to a place and put them together. It's a very social job. You get to visit with people in the vineyard all day long, chattering back and forth, eating grapes here and there. Uh, there's been no time for these grapes to ferment, so that side of the fun will have to pass for later. But you have a, a really nice day. You're out in the weather. You're out, I mean, out in the sunshine with, with, with congenial people, doing a good job and doing a work you really, really kind of enjoy, and, and working with nature. Really, it would be a, a joy to have a job like that in that season of the year, picking grapes, and, of course, maybe even looking forward to stomping those grapes out and making some wine at a later time. Well, this guy, he agreed with him a penny a day, and he got him out to work. Well, he went out about the third hour, three hours later, because this guy has got a big vineyard, and he's not going to get it all in today with the workers that he's already hired. Understand that little lesson? He wants more people in the vineyard. So he goes out and he sees some more people. These are the guys that didn't get up early this morning. You know, they, they, they weren't busy working until the ninth hour. They just didn't get up in time. But they finally made it down to the place. And he calls him over the set and he says, uh, what are you doing standing around here? He says, you go into the vineyard, whatever is right I will give you. So they went to work. He went out the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he keeps picking up laborers all day long. And he's willing to do this because he's got to get those grapes in. And he wants them in tonight if he can get them in at all. He went out at the eleventh hour. One hour left until it's going to be too dark to pick grapes anymore. And he found other people standing by. He says, what are you standing around all day doing nothing? And they said, well, nobody has hired us. Well, where have you been? Is his next question. But he didn't ask that. He says, get out in the vineyard. Whatever is right, I will give you. Now, that takes a little amount of faith to go ahead and go to work, but apparently they did. Because there's no contract made with any of the workers he picks up through the remainder of the day, right? You go out there, and I'll be fair with you. So they went to work, picked grapes. And, of course, in his case, these additional workers, you know, sometimes when, you, when you're having to buy later, you're prepared to pay more than you would normally pay because you've got to have them. And I think in many ways that's what was in this guy's mind. I've got to have these guys. If they're not here, I'm not going to get this thing done. Well, when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard got all his stewards says, get all these people and bring them in here, beginning with the first to the last. And when they that were came were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Oh, ho! The guys that had only worked one hour out of that whole day got the penny. When the first came, in fact, everybody, from all of them, all the way down the line, got a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they received everyone likewise a penny. And when they got it, they started murmuring against the good man of the house, saying, These last have worked but one hour, 
And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Now, if he had paid these men the other way around, if he had paid these guys off and they had left, they would have never known what he paid the guys who came later in the day, would they? So why did he do it this way? So the parable would work. How hard has this got to be? How much interpretation do we have to find? The parable will work. All right, they're all upset about this. Why did you do this? He said, well, and he said to them, friend, I know I'm not doing you any wrong. Didn't you agree to work for me all day for a penny and weren't you happy? Yeah. Didn't, weren't you glad you had the job? Yeah. Haven't you enjoyed working in my vineyard all day? Because I let you eat grapes. I provided water for you, good, clean, cold water from the well. I, I gave you some food to eat at lunch. I mean, haven't you had a good day here? Well, yeah. Well, what are you upset about? Take what is yours, he said. Go your way. I will give to this last the same thing I gave it to you. Isn't it lawful for me to do what I want with my own? Yeah. What's the lesson? Well, you know, from a sinner's point of view, and just a poor old garden variety, ordinary man in the street center, one of the things that's beautiful about this is the fact that, that if I come to God, even at the last moment, and my life is nearly over, and I finally have, at long last, got through my thick head some things, and I have repented and come to God, He will forgive me. And I, I don't have to have labored all day long. I don't have to have been out here in the field all day. That's a really wonderful thing for me to understand. But it's not what this parable is about. It is not what this parable is about. And that's the surprising thing in a way, when you, if you'll just take the time sometimes to really understand what the parable is about. He said, Can't, isn't it lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is your eye evil because I do good? Now, I, had, I don't think I, I, I've heard about the evil eye before many times, and I've, I never really have bothered or cared enough to go looking and see if I could find out what it meant. I, I know that there is a superstition about the evil eye. There was a little Abner Evil Eye Flegel who could put the whammy on a person, uh, you know, and he had a double whammy which took an awful lot out of him. I know about all that, but, but I never imagined that that's necessarily what the, what the Bible is talking about. But listen, you know, here is an illustration of what might have been meant in the first century by the evil eye. He says, is your eye evil because I, do, because I am good? I have been generous because what you're doing, you're upset with my generosity to these other guys. I have done something really good for them, and now you're all upset about what I have done. It's almost as though to have an evil eye is to see evil in something that is not. It is to have an eye that looks upon things as though they were evil. It's the person who sees demons behind every bush, who sees wickedness wherever he looks, the hypercritical person, the person who's always sitting in judgment of other people, has, in a sense, you have to remember, by the way, that the word evil, in a biblical sense, does not necessarily mean slavering jaws. It basically is adverse. Or, you know, in the Old Testament, wherever you find the word evil, it probably translated adversity, and you will be much more accurate in your understanding of what the word means. It means basically adverse. So here's a man with an evil eye, as it were, and the evil eye is the one who sees evil, in something that has been, good, been done good by another person. I really think the lesson for us in this parable is not so much, although I think it is true that, that the last moment, like the thief on the cross, one can achieve salvation, that God's grace is sufficient for the worst sinners among us. And all those things I understand are very, very true. But you know, what's interesting about this parable is that what takes place among these, uh, through the 12 hours of this day is manifestly unfair. It's not fair. It's not fair to work one guy 12 hours and pay him a penny and to pay another, work another guy one hour and pay him a penny. And, of course, I think the presumption oftentimes would be with people to say, well, you know, look, I've been out here. I've borne the heat of the day. I've, I've been a Christian for a long time. I've sacrificed and, and I've, I've, I've got done without and I've kept the Sabbath and lost my job for it. And here this guy comes along and he's in the kingdom and he didn't do any of these things. I think we could easily fall into a... Kind of a wrong way of looking at these, these things and the realization that what we have had all the years that we might look back and say that we're in the heat of the day, we have the un, unspeakable privilege of having a relationship with God for all these years, which should be a source of great joy. And we should feel, look what I have had all this period of time, and this poor devil is only just now coming to understand what I have had all along. 
My life has had meaning. I've known where I'm going. Sure, I have suffered, but I have borne the heat of the day. I have developed character. I have become stronger in the faith. I have received more than he has received now in this life. And God says also, through the writer of Hebrews, that God is not unjust to forget your labor of love and to forget the work that you have borne and so forth. And so don't assume that what is being told to us here is it doesn't matter that you've borne the heat of the day. That's not what this parable is about. What this parable is about is the perennial human habit. Instead of being happy and being content with what he has, is to look at what somebody else has got and to give away our joy. To give away our happiness. We're willing to just throw it out the window because it doesn't measure up to what we thought it ought to have been related to what somebody else had got. That perennial habit and problem we've got of always measuring ourselves among ourselves and measuring ourselves by ourselves. Now let me take you to another parable, this one back in Luke again. This one in Luke 15. This one's almost as familiar as the lines in your hand. If you've gone to church very long, read the Bible very much, because what has been preached more than the parable of the prodigal son. And it's an important parable to us in, in so many different ways of our life. He said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of the goods that falls, falls to me. And he divided to him his living. And not many days afterward, he gathered all his stuff together. He took his journey into a far country. And there he blew everything he had on riotous living. I can imagine what that was like. And when he had spent everything, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and ain't that the way? When you're finally broke, you're down and out, then then there's nothing to buy anymore. I mean, there's no food, no nothing. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he put him in his fields to feed swine. Why swine? Because the parable is designed to take the man as low as he can possibly go. This is a parable. It's an allegory, mind you, not a, not a, a true story from the past. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man would give him anything. He's ready to get down and eat with the pigs. They'll feed the pigs because they're a money cash crop. And when he came to himself, he said to himself, How many servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I am dying out here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. He got his speech together, right? It's all rehearsed. I know exactly what I want to say. He was a long way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It's a beautiful story. And, you know, every, I think all of us take so much heart in this because we realize that we have gone astray in life. And we realize that we've wandered far away from God. This is a beautiful hymn. You know, I've wandered far away from God. And now I'm coming home. Too long the paths of sin I've trod. Now I'm coming home. And it just, it just can reach down in the core of a person. And, and we identify with this guy. We really identify with him because we know what it means to us to know that when we start that path home, God sees us a long way off, and he runs out and grabs us and falls on our neck and kisses us and says, let's make a feast. My son was lost. He's home. Right? We all love the story because we can see ourselves in it so much. So they killed the fatted calf. They made a great feast. They're celebrating. There's noise. They're singing. There's dancing. And his elder son all this time was out working like a dog in the fields, hot, sweaty, dirty, as he came in and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and said, What in the world is going on here? And he said, Your brother's come. And knowing the way it is with brothers, sometimes the sibling rivalries, the, the contentions, the competition between brothers, I can imagine that he has, must have gritted his teeth when he heard your brother has come. I can imagine it went all over him with a shot of adrenaline. He could feel it all the way to his toes when he heard your brother has come. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry. But that's not us, is it? We would never find ourselves in that category, would we? Because we're the prodigal son. We're the one that went away, and we're the one that came back. I don't suppose it ever occurs to us that we can be both of the boys at different times in our lives. That having been the prodigal son who went away and came back, that we can even later at some time find ourselves in the position of the older son who is resentful of what God has done for or has given to someone else. What's interesting to me is the older son on this day abandoned his joy. He walked away and left it. You know, I, didn't I say that, that, that joy isn't everywhere? 
Joy doesn't, doesn't present itself to you at every turn in the road like wisdom does. It flits out of the darkness. It comes at you suddenly when you didn't expect it. It's like coming out to get in your car with the realization it's a cold morning and I've got to scrape my windows to find out somebody's already scraped it for you. I think that's marvelous. You know, it's, you, you feel wonderful. It's a, it's, a, it's a magic thing to have happen to you. And here you come home and you've got a wonderful life. You have a farm. You're your dad's heir. You're the firstborn. It's all going to be yours one of these days. And you're working and you're enjoying. You've got a wife. You've got kids. Everything's working in your life perfectly until this louse of a brother shows up on the scene. And a man treats joy like it was a cockroach that ran across the cabinet. And he killed it. Just like you and I killed joy day after day in our lives. Instead of being happy, instead of taking great pleasure in what God has done for us, we can't just say, here I am, look at, I, look, look at what God has done for me. We've got to look over there and see what's he doing over there. And what are they doing? And why are they getting away with that? And why are you letting that happen, Lord? And how can they possibly do that? They shouldn't be doing that. That's wrong. Don't they know that's wrong? You, does this stuff sound familiar to you? Well, I, I, I read this. And I see what he says to this boy. He said, I've never transgressed at any time your commandment, which is probably a stretch. And you have never given me a kid that I might make, 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 make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, your son was come home, who has devoured your living with harlots, you have killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. Can you find no joy in that? And this, it was fit that we should make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he was found. Not only do you have an ongoing reason in your life to have joy in your life, we've got special reason on this particular day, but you just haven't been able to, haven't been able to have it, have you? You had to kill it, didn't you? Joy, ah, it's, 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 it's there. And it runs into our life from many different directions. But unfortunately, a lot of times we don't even see it. Sometimes we pay no attention to it. Sometimes we are unable to appreciate it because other things are interfering in our lives. We just don't grasp joy when it comes our way. There's another interesting story. It's found in the 21st chapter of John. I'm not going to turn to it. You feel free to. This is after the ascension of Jesus, and he has appeared to his disciples along the the shore of the Sea of Galilee. They're out fishing in a boat, and he's already got a fire laid and fish roasting alongside the fire like they would set them up on little sticks, you know, to, to cook. And he asked them, children, have you caught anything? And they said no. And the story, he had them well, let the net down on the other side of the boat, and they let the net down in there and broke it. They had so many fish in it. And just like that, Peter said, it's the Lord. And he threw himself in the water. He was naked, you know, and came to shore as fast as he could to see Jesus as they all got in as quick as they could. And they sat down and they ate. And in a little while they were... They didn't want to say anything at first. It's funny. They, they know it's him, and they don't want to say it's him exactly because they, they, this, nothing like this has ever happened to anybody in the world, much less to them, to, to be with a man that they knew was dead. And there must have been also enormous joy in being with him at the same time, fear. And in Peter's case, I think there was a special fear that was born out of guilt, which is one of the greatest joy killers any man has ever known, because he had denied Christ three times. And he really wondered where he stood with Jesus. And so after they had eaten, they began to take a little walk along the gravelly shore and talk together. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know I have affection for you. Will you feed my sheep? Jesus did not say that what Peter had done was all right. What he said was, you and I are all right. It's okay with you and me. Feed my sheep. They walked a little further down, he said. Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, yes, I have affection for you. Feed my lambs. A little further down the street, he said, do you, Peter, do you have, really have affection for me? He says, Lord, you know everything. You know this. You know that I have affection for me. Feed my sheep. What you did was wrong, but you and I are okay. Tell me something. What's it worth to know that things are okay between you and God? Is this not a cause for joy? Now, it was a little troubling in one sense of the word. When Jesus said, you know, when you were young, you put on your clothes and you went where you wanted to go and you went when you wanted to go and did what you wanted to do. But when you're old, somebody else is going to take you. 
Somebody else is going to decide what you're going to put on. Somebody else is going to bind you hand and foot. He basically told Peter he was going to, what he was going to suffer and was going to die for his name's sake. But it was out in the future. And even there, there could be a little bit of satisfaction in knowing that you're important enough to God that this is going to happen to you. Here was a moment in time when Peter should have felt, and I think must have felt, great joy. But he did something that is common to all people. Probably the greatest single mistake we make in this regard. He turned around, and a few yards behind him on the beach was John. And he said, Lord, what about him? And Jesus said, what? what's it to you what's about him? If I will that he still be alive when I come back to the earth, what's that to you? You do what I've called you to do. You follow me. Those three little words, actually it's four in the way Peter used them, are the most devastating in the human tongue and probably do kill more joy in our lives than any other. The words are, Lord, what about him? You see, him is none of your business. We have a terrible time, and it probably destroys more joy in our lives than anything else, the fact that we just can't mind our own business. I've been in the ministry now for many, many years. And I have seen a lot of grief and a lot of anger, a lot of heartache and a lot of hurt. And I would have to say that one of the chief reasons is because people would not mind their own business. Confusion and hurt, division in churches, fights and bickerings. It happens in churches, it happens in families, it happens just not the Church of God. It happens to Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics, and two spirit, seed in the Spirit, predestinarians. It, all of them have the same old human problems because we are all human beings and we just can't sometimes leave other people's business alone. And remember Jesus' answer. Don't ever forget it. Maybe you want to memorize it. What is that to you? You follow me. That's really all you've got to know. And you know, there is enormous joy in that. I think that joy is like love. You can make it, and you can give it. We've had examples of that already today. But you can't really take it, and you can't demand it. It will come to you in one way or another. It will come in ways great, and it will come in ways that are small. You can deny it. And you can kill it. But it's better to cherish it and to preserve it and to share it. And, you know, when you really understand what's at stake at this, you'd be in a position where if one night you were like Paul, you'd been arrested and beaten, you were kind of a lot of bit of pain and very uncomfortable along with your, your fellow traveler in the faith, but put in jail and they clamped your feet in the stocks down there and left you where you couldn't get comfortable. There's no way. You know, you just imagine being in a dungeon with your feet in stocks to where your ankles can't even be moved, and that's where you are for the night. And there they sat, and they looked at one another. And you know what? I have a feeling it wasn't very long before one of them left. And before midnight, they were singing songs. That, my friends, is where joy can take you. The realization that God is with you, that you are suffering for His name's sake, it's not because of your own stupidity, and you're not sitting there saying, Lord, why isn't Peter in jail? The truth that is in that small moment is one that you can take with you for the rest of your life.